Hello, welcome to Community Library of Mississippi. Those uh, virtual. And today we have um, Rosemary Jenkins and she's presenting Juvenile Offender Reform through the Virtual Community Speaking Series. Rosemary Jenkins is a native of Detroit. She has lived in California for decades. She was formerly a literature teacher for the Los Angeles Unified School District. She is a contributing writer for several news outlets and the author of five books, Meredith, etc., which I am the publisher and acquisition editor, published her last two books, uh, The Southern Phoenix, which is historical fiction, and Juvenile Offenders, which is about juvenile offenders. And most of the writers were actually juvenile offenders um, in the system. And they uh, participated in her rehabilitative writing uh, program in California. And I am the uh, organizer for Community Library of Mississippi right here in Jackson, Mississippi. And I am honored to present to you Rosemary Jenkins and information about her books is in the uh, uh, chat. Thank you, Rosemary. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Meredith for inviting me to be one of the speakers in this series and for the uh, Mississippi uh, Library Program. And I appreciate all of you that have signed on. I know it's the middle of your, uh, perhaps your work day or uh, the, one way or the other in the middle of your day. Uh, I'm in California in the Los Angeles area. And um, I, before we get started, I would like to just take a moment for us to remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg and all her contributions. So let's take maybe 15 seconds to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, since I am in California, I am a teacher by profession, but uh, as Meredith mentioned, I've written a number of articles uh, for various news outlets. I uh, wrote a series on how the various ethnicities have influenced the development of our society. And um, my most recent book, uh, Juvenile Offenders from Big Wheels to the Big House, uh, she's holding up uh, the cover of the book now. That uh, illustration, by the way, is by one of the uh, inmates at the time. He has uh, been released. His name is Alipati uh, Wilson. Um, so because I've been working for the most part with California inmates and also uh, almost all of whom are males, I, I have worked with a couple females, uh, I am going to make this presentation based in large part on the California perspective. Uh, there will be time for questions and answers a little bit later. So I'll be glad to uh, listen to them and hopefully be able to answer your questions. Um, going back a little bit into history, uh, and I'm sure a lot of, this is not new to a lot of you, but uh, back in the day, let's say during World War II and shortly thereafter, uh, people that fought in the, the uh, war yeah. were promised a GI Bill that would help them purchase homes at a reasonable cost at a, a reasonable interest rate. Unfortunately, the federal government did not extend that to uh, Black people or uh, other uh, minorities, and even women for that part. It's as uh, lately with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing, we we're reminded about all the things that women couldn't do up until relatively recently. Um, the problem is that because uh, black folk and other people of color weren't able to purchase homes, they weren't able to build up equity. 
and the equity could have been used to pass on to their children to help them go to college and uh, to break out of communities that had been redlined uh, to keep certain groups in, in one area as opposed to another area. Uh, let's face it, uh, new communities, new communities um, were neither white nor black nor anything else, but the redlining and restrictive covenants kept uh, people out of certain areas and into other areas. So uh, because of that, because of the GI Bill and Federal Housing Administration not working in, in favor of uh, people of color, uh, they were at a great disadvantage and in many cases uh, are still at that same disadvantage today. Um, one of the problems, one of the legacies of that is that uh, you have children that uh, are in homes that are dysfunctional. P uh, parents that may be uh, alcoholics, drug addicts, ex-convicts, and the laws, I don't know if it, it's the same all the way through the country, but I know that a lot of uh, people coming out of prison are not allowed to stay or socialize in any way with people that have a prison background, which often meant that they couldn't live at home. So they get out of prison, they don't have a job, they don't have the skills, they can't live at home. And so a lot of them were forced into the streets. And even children that um, were at home, they suffered greatly from the abuse from their parents. There was a lot of, more than you realize, a lot of incest from parents, from uh, uncles, from grandparents, um, next door neighbors. Uh, it's pretty terrible. So uh, a lot of parents even were simply unfit to be parents and threw their children out or sent them to live with a grandparent, and even if the grandparent were wonderful, uh, there was still this feeling of, well, why did my parents abandon me? And so they sought uh, family in the best way they could, and that was through a gang. And unfortunately, the gang leaders, in order to, you know, I'll be your father figure, but you will have to commit, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain type of crime that I tell you to. And Unfortunately, in committing those crimes, they uh, were not prepared to you know, know how to do it and often got caught. And so we have a, a large percentage of our, our incarcerated people that became uh, incarcerated at early ages in, in, as teenagers or in their early 20s. Now, recently, uh, California has uh, two laws that went into effect, AB 260 and 261. Uh, 260 said that if you were uh, tried as an adult when you were under 18 years of age, you would be able to, if everything else went well, uh, you could be eligible for parole after 12 years, which wasn't automatic. And then AB uh, 261 uh, expanded it to uh, if you were under 23 years of age. So that has made uh, a big difference. Um, but uh, we have this problem of huge incarceration of young people. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of, uh, and I will refer to them as my friends because I've been uh, corresponding with many of them for years. I've kept every letter they've ever sent me and, and made copies of my own letters to them. So um, it's, it's really quite uh, sad what has happened to so many of them. This one person, uh, he was high on drugs admittedly, but he decided um, he thought it would be fun to shoot a police car. Now the car was, it was parked, it was empty. There were no police around. But long story short, he wound up getting caught that same afternoon. And uh, they said that uh, they were going to give him 103 years in prison for that. So they plea bargained him to 36 years, and uh, which is ridiculous. It's so disproportionate. People can commit a murder and get a lesser sentence than what he was offered. And plea bargaining is uh, certainly one way that the 
the just so-called justice system works for too many people where you wind up being afraid that if you go to trial you'll get a worse sentence and so you plea to <clears throat> the sentence they offer you and you don't have the kind of representation you need now in uh my dealings with a, a lot of uh, my friends behind bars um it took them in, in many cases a number of years to uh realize that they didn't have to maintain that kind of lifestyle when they first went in as young people they were so frightened uh, that they would uh, seek quote unquote family within the prison system and uh, often commit crimes behind bars. But at a certain point, they had an epiphany and said, you know, I don't want this anymore. So uh, they let it be known and they were put into, they were debriefed and put into uh, another cell yard. Uh, and uh, and again, I don't know how it is in every other state, but I know in California and many of our prisons, uh, they're given the opportunity to take classes. Uh, several of my people have uh, been released. The young man in question, while he was in prison, created a number of mentorship programs and, and really did a fabulous job. But he earned several uh, associate's degrees and also certifications. And now that he's out, he's been um, working on his bachelor's degree. Uh, and I know a number of other people that have become attorneys and, uh, you know, pursued other occupations. Uh, he was lucky in the sense that he did have support to pursue those endeavors. And he did have support uh, by and large by uh, prison guards and administrators and there were a lot of programs that the prison offered uh, that could expand his horizons and uh, i uh, was able he asked me if i could help him with his pro packet and there were like uh, 10 different uh, projects i guess you could call it that they that he had to work on and i typed it all up for him uh, and uh, it, was, it came out to about 40 pages, single space. And I learned so much from typing uh, this up. But he, he's one of the success stories. But we have a lot of other people. There's another a young man with whom I worked on a neighborhood council. Uh, he is a bipolar, gay, Latino. And uh, as a young man, he was having a hard time understanding himself and coming to terms with who he is and, and was at the time. And he tried to commit suicide a, a number of times. And uh, this uh, one time, uh, to make a long story short, he had gone online to meet someone who was also gay. And uh, they got together uh, and at his house. And then they took a walk and they came back to the car. and. He started hearing voices that said that his new friend was going to kill him. So he took out box cutters and wound up slashing this person to death. He called the police right away, but he was not mentally well. And even after incarceration has tried to commit suicide a number of times. And one of the problems uh, is that we don't have the kind of uh, uh, assets in the various facilities to help people. Uh, I know in LA we have uh, what they call the Twin Towers where uh, more people that with mental health issues are being housed there for often relatively minor crimes. And so we, we do need to understand that not everybody with mental health issues needs to be behind bars because of uh, situations that they've gotten themselves into. Uh, Certainly, you, you've uh, heard about the recent killings of uh, the one uh, gentleman recently that was his brother called the police uh, to help because he was having a, a mental health crisis and the police wind, uh, wound up killing him. So we really need to retrain our, our people and to have real dedication and commitment to changing the way things are. Now, in my research for the book, uh, I discovered that uh, Germany and Norway have absolutely fabulous systems. Uh, and I have to hand it to Germany, uh, despite their relatively recent past, they are in the foremost uh, forefront of uh, 
progressive ideas for uh, prison reform. Uh, I know that, for instance, in, in Norway, uh, the inmates are treated as human beings. They have keys to their own lockers. The guards cannot go in and ransack their, their quarters. There's a, a real privacy issue. Uh, they're treated fairly and justly and mercifully. The, uh, the guards have a real commitment. They're, they're, they're uh, better uh, educated uh, with degrees uh, and have the, the proper training. And a lot of times these people uh, can be released on a, a day basis to uh, work in the community and then come back. And the findings are both in the system in Norway and Germany is that the recidivism rate is extremely low. And it's, it's certainly not uh, counterintuitive uh, at all to understand that if you treat people as human beings and treat the prison system as one for rehabilitation and reentry, that things can change. So uh, that's something that uh, a number of our wardens have heard about these programs that have traveled overseas to uh, witness for themselves and examine the programs and are trying to apply them to uh, uh, the prisons uh, over which they are in charge. Um, so the jail system. Uh, Rosemary, I have a picture of Germany from your book. Oh, wait. You can see it. That's oh, oh, is that the one, one of the cells? In Germany, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know how well people can see it. But there are a number of illustrations in, in the book. All of the illustrations are done by inmates themselves. And uh, it, the, the illustrations themselves really give a great deal of insight into uh, their life's journey. You know, they share what life was like for them growing up, how they came to commit the crimes they did, what life was like in, uh, in prison for them, uh, their, the epiphanies that many of them have undergone and uh, you know, their desire to uh, constantly, they're writing me about their desire to be given the chance to make a, a positive mark on, on the world. And uh, when our inmates are released into society, if they're not given the tools to be successful, then they can't be positive stakeholders. So we want to give them uh, education, career options. And I know people say, well, you know, I have to pay for my own education. Why should you give uh, uh, someone who's been in jail, someone who's committed a crime? Well, the long and the short of it is, if we do that, taxpayers in the long run will wind up putting out less money and our society will improve greatly uh, when people are able to have a stake in their community and have the opportunity to uh, to contribute. And all of them with whom I write uh, are asking for second chances. And another thing, just incidentally, uh, as I said, I've been uh, corresponding. Occasionally, I'm able to speak to them by phone, but corresponding with them. And so many of them have uh, been suicidal and have said to me that the fact that I've been writing them and encouraging them and showed them that I believe in them, that it has helped them turn the corner and want to to help now some people uh, <coughs> to help improve their lives and, and look forward to a day that when they might get out. Now, even people that are considered uh, lifers, that's not always the case because a uh, governor can, you know, sometimes pardon someone that's uh, been given a life sentence. So uh, there are opportunities. And for those uh, with whom I write that uh, probably will never get out, I encourage them to get the kind of education they need so that they can mentor others. A, a lot of prisons have programs where at-risk youth are brought in, not a, not a tough love program, but are, are brought in to be mentored by uh, individual inmates that have gone through a, a training process. And 
it's really helped uh, those young people turn their lives around. So um, we need to encourage people, uh, not so much the idea of being a pen pal, but as being a, a committed person to uh, working with them and encouraging them. And, and often uh, they'll ask me to uh, work with their families to call grandma or mother or brother or sister. So I've wound up got, uh, getting a sort of an extended, <laughs> extended family that way beyond the individual inmate. I've, I've become close with relatives as well. Now, uh, our parole laws here in, in California, one of the things that you probably have been hearing about is no cash bail. We've been pushing that in California. Uh, somebody could commit or be accused of committing a relatively minor crime, but uh, the bail, the cash bail is exorbitant for them. So they wind up staying in jail even before they've been uh, uh, indicted even before, well before they might even uh, go to trial. And in some cases, there's not enough evidence and they've, uh, the charges have been dropped. And, and the problem is that uh, because of this cash bail uh, situation, uh, it puts such a burden on themselves and their families that uh, a lot of times the, the spouse, the partner uh, leaves them uh, and uh, it really wreaks havoc on uh, the family uh, situation. And for those who might be arrested and the charges dropped after a few days, a lot of times they have jobs that uh, whose employers are not sympathetic and they lose their jobs. So it's certainly a vicious circle. And so we in California have been working very hard to eliminate cash bail, except for those that have committed, you know, uh, a major crime like murder or, or rape. Uh, and uh, therefore it, it gives them opportunities to hold on to their jobs and uh, keep their family together and uh, get proper uh, representation from community lawyers uh, beyond the, the public defender necessarily. So that that's a big issue. Um, a lot of the inmates, uh, understand that they need to take responsibility for their action. Uh, part of the parole process is uh, often to write to either the victim or if the victim is no longer alive to friends and family, not asking uh, for forgiveness, but taking responsibility for what they've done. And that makes a, a big difference uh, when it's a, a genuine understanding of what they did, why they did it, and how they can change their lives. It, that's uh, really important. Um, so many of them have, uh, one of the people with whom I work is a senior editor at the San Quentin News. And he's done a, just a, a fabulous uh, job as a writer and, um, and has started many programs, writing programs there. He's been, Van Jones has had him in a documentary and uh, W. Kamau Bell also. And so there are lots of opportunities that can be afforded to them if they're uh, willing to reach out and, and participate. So having programs in the various uh, institutions uh, that provide those opportunities is absolutely uh, essential. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing about is, um, and it's, I just had no idea before I started working with uh, my friends there, is how the staff at these prisons often bait the inmates to fight with each other, to, uh, uh, to attack each other, to gamble, to use drugs, they're conduits for, for drugs, uh, and uh, so it, uh, it creates so much anger and rage inside uh, a lot of the inmates that uh, sometimes when they get pushed too far, they, they strike back. They may curse at the guard or uh, sometimes even throw fecal material or other waste products at them uh, as a way of showing that they, have, they still have some kind of power over their lives. But we have got to have a different way of thinking so that 
uh, we have the kinds of uh, guards and other administrators that have a genuine commitment to uh, making positive change within the prison system and with the, the penal code. Um, I just want to see if there are a few other things. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the things that, uh, and I alluded to this earlier, uh, is that once the inmate gets through the term that he or she's been assigned, uh, the whole idea should be about rehabilitation, re-entry, reintegration, and how they can go about being successful once they are out. And not all prisons, not all state policies uh, pursue that. So that's absolutely essential if we're going to make the prison system one that I think it should be, and that is not just for punishment, uh, but for rehabilitation. Um, uh, another policy that I've been working on uh, for those that are still in is making uh, internet uh, available to all inmates for free. Now, in some pr uh, prisons, uh, if they have the money, they can get a tablet and be able to download a book. But I, I want the uh, all the inmates to have access to the internet so that they can uh, do personal enrichment, do research for classes. Some of them need to work on a GED and others that have obtained that or a high school diploma can uh, move forward with uh, classwork and, and research to get their advanced degrees. So uh, having that internet access is, I think, crucial. Now, some people uh, talk about uh, the concern, oh, they'll uh, get in touch with uh, criminals on the outside and, and make criminal plans. Well, there's something called I, uh, J Cloud, uh, which is like iCloud. And just as a teacher, I know that when we have computers in the classroom, uh, our students can't just go on the computer and access anything they want, you know, uh, because there, there's concern. Are they going to access porn or, or some nefarious uh, action? So the, the uh, J Cloud the, uh, for inmates is works the same way. It's limited as to uh, what they can access, but it's so important that they're able to, to do that. Uh, we need to work on proportionate sentencing for a young man who shot a car to be uh, threatened with 103 years in jail is ridiculous. And as I mentioned earlier, a person can actually com commit murder and get a lesser sentence than someone who's uh, stolen something. And, and it, it just goes to show uh, where our priorities are in this country, that property seems to be uh, of higher value than human life. Um, another program that I'm working with is Teen Court. This is a wonderful program. I'd like to see it across the country. Um, the program works with high schools, not necessarily just with uh, uh, students at risk, but others with interest in the law, uh, learning about it or wanting to get into it. And they learn a lot about the law. And then at different times during the school year, they actually go to a, a courtroom. And there is a three judge panel. Uh, the uh, defendant is given the opportunity to, you know, to say whether he or she wants to be judged by this teen court. But the jury is made up of teenagers from the high school that have been trained they listen to the case and they go into the uh, uh, jury room under supervision, but uh, they're not told what to do or how, how to think. And they throw the uh, pros and cons about, discuss it, brainstorm, and then they decide whether the person is innocent or guilty. And if they find that person guilty, what kind of sentence? They come back out, they let the three judge panel know. The panel can agree with all or part or none of their decision. And uh, the defendant has agreed to uh, abide by that decision. It's a wonderful experience for these young people to see the inner workings of the uh, law and the justice departments. And, um, and, it, and it gives defendants a, a fair chance at uh, 
getting a second chance before they go into a, a, a penitentiary. Um, I do want to, uh, I don't know how many of you may have been on Felicia uh, Brookins' um, panel about a month or so ago, but she had uh, a former Klansman on named George Melbaney, and he wrote a book called Cups Up. And I want to read to you um, a sentence or two uh, from that book. None of these guys had ever had a chance. Most of them were doomed to spend their lives in prison or die young. Futility leads to crime and looting. It's my turn. You society owes me that much. And I think that's, um, here's a man who as a very young person uh, became a Klan member and a leader when he was in his late teens and early 20s, went to prison, but when he got out of prison, he had decided he didn't want that lifestyle anymore. He went into the military service. When he got out, he wound up going to college. He owns his own uh, business now in engineering. Uh, he's quite an environmentalist and uh, he's written this book as an example to inspire others. So the whole idea of giving second chances, even to people with whom we might otherwise look askew, like a Klan's person, uh, and even people that have committed murder. I've worked with uh, several of them, some of whom have been released and have become very important uh, members of the community. So uh, that's another thing in Norway and, and Germany. If you commit murder, the maximum sentence overall is 25 years. And if the person isn't seen to have been uh, ready for rehabilitation, they can tack on another uh, five years. But even for, not the most egregious crimes, of course, but uh, even some murder offenses, they can get out in 25 years. So uh, they're afforded the opportunity to be productive again. I think it, it's time uh, for me to allow, I mean, I could go on and on, but it's time for me to allow people uh, questions and answers. If you have any, I'd be glad to answer them. No questions? Yes, oh. Rosemary. Yes. Is the, is the prison system funded by the state or is it a private uh, well, or it's funded uh, privately. Our uh, our prison system per se is well it depends on what level, whether it's a jail at the county level or a state prison. Uh, uh, those are not private institutions. Now we do have detention centers for immigrants that have crossed the border and are being held. I did uh, go down to one that's been in the news. Uh, with some frequency, Adelante uh, Detention Center uh, in Southern California, and uh, uh, the conditions are, are pretty horrendous. And often those are run by private institutions. GEO, GEO is one of them, and their record, I, I know with Adelante, you may have read about this a while back, there was, uh, the conditions were so bad, people were getting sick that there was a hunger strike. And, uh, you know, people uh, did die from conditions in the prison and, and hence the hunger strike. So we're trying to do a lot to uh, not allow at any level in any state in the country for private prisons, because it's all money making. And they, they've lowered the bar so that uh, if it doesn't take much to be sent to prison, they're gonna make more money uh, by, you know, the more inmates that come to their institutions. So. Uh, we're really trying to do away with uh, private institutions, but uh, none of the, the uh, prisons or jails in California are privately run except for the detention facilities for immigrants. But mostly it started out as a, as a state prison system. Now it has become private, which makes it turns out to be a money making state. Right. Not, not and all said, of the California prisons now become to come private, and it is much different from the state institution. Well, as I said, it's not that way in California. It is that way in some other states, and I don't have firsthand knowledge of what the other forty-nine states are, are doing. 
but I do understand that some do have private prisons. But um, regardless, whether it's public or private, they all need reform. Uh, I want to read true. something. I want to read something that someone had in the uh, chat. Uh, Irma Love, she said, at this time, where I live, our system has been reformed so much that the incarcerated wants to stay. We are now trying to add family wrap up around services. I'm not. Uh, I'm hoping, Irma, Irma, could you tell me where this is, what state it is? Maybe you can unmute or type it up. Oh, Wisconsin? Okay. Is it Wisconsin? Oh, I see, yeah, Wisconsin, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I'm not doubting exactly what you're saying, but uh, I, there are uh, people that have been in prison so long that there is a real fear of how they're going to uh, survive on the outside. Uh, I don't know, of all the years that I've been working with all the people that I have, uh, none of them, regardless of, you know, some have uh, better conditions than others, but none of them have indicated to me that they want to stay. Uh, but I, I do understand the concern uh, of some who have uh, been in there so long and they don't have any skills. I mean, because I know Indiana, for instance, I've been working with a uh, well, he's not a young man anymore, but a gentleman. <clears throat> uh, there was a professor, Laura Bates, who wrote this book called Shakespeare Saved My Life. And uh, it's, it really centers around this one person, uh, Larry, I'll, just, I'll give his first name. Uh, and he is so brilliant. He was able to interpret a lot of Shakespeare's plays beyond what any of the professors had ever come up with in terms of interpretations. And uh, he helped write a handbook, he helped write uh, play adaptations, uh, but nevertheless, the, the conditions, well, I wanna say two things. I think it was under Pence, when Pence was still uh, governor there, that they did away with the opportunity for inmates to get certification in any skills or to get college credits, which seems to me to be counterproductive. Also, in, in I, I contacted the professor and was able to contact Larry and he, uh, he and I have been corresponding and his early letters were just fabulous. And then I noticed that his mental uh, faculties were deteriorating and I was so worried for him because you know he was telling me I know you're going to think I'm crazy but I'm not I'm hearing voices uh, come out of the television and he was just you know going on and on and I was so concerned about him I called the professor and she basically and it really upset me because she her the success of her book was largely based upon uh Larry's contributions, and yet it was like, well, I'm through with that now. So I called the prison, I spoke with the captain in charge, and I expressed my concern for uh, his welfare. And um, they did intercede, and they sent him to uh, a facility where he could get the, the mental health care that he needed. And I was able to speak with uh, someone uh, with whom that he has been working and she and I have been, uh, you know, talking to each other and corresponding, but she uh, assured me that he has, it was because of me that he got the care. And this goes back to what I was saying, that if people can believe in and, and uh, help inspire people to move forward and that their lives are not worthless, that they, despite circumstances or even the crimes they've committed, that they can move forward and be contributing members, whether in jail or after jail, uh, it's very important. So I, I certainly urge people uh, in one way or the other to get involved. And there are all kinds of organizations in every community that deal with uh, reentry programs. Uh, I know a couple of the reentry programs here in the Los Angeles area are run by former inmates, uh, one of whom uh, became a lawyer. So there, there's just all kinds of possibility. 
And if I'm not mistaken, this lawyer had uh, actually committed murder, which got him into prison in the first place. Well, so, so it, in answer to your statement about wanting to stay in prison, I, th I think one would have to understand all the circumstances. Because remember what I said that even in, in California, we're trying to change it. If you're released and your parent, even just one parent or a sibling has a background of crime, you're not allowed to live in that home. And if you're the, in the neighborhood, if you have neighbors that have been involved in a crime. So where are these people supposed to go right out of, of prison? They don't have money. Uh, many of them have lost contact with uh, any family members that uh, might be able to support them financially or with family members who don't want anything to do with them anymore. So uh, it's a real double-edged sword. And now in the chat, um, Rosa um, typed uh, institutionalized. I'm, I'm not sure what the, the question is. Uh, her response to to the question was that the, that the uh, inmates have become institutionalized. That's why they are comfortable just not, you know, wanting to be released because they're institutionalized. She just typed that in the chat. Yeah, I, I see that now, but I'm I'm not sure that I can. She's entitled to her opinion. <laughs> Let uh -huh. me uh, agree to disagree on that. Okay, and um, what I wonder, um, my my biggest concern is um, exploitation and dehumanization. Yes, uh, I, of course, I live in Mississippi, and some of the worst uh, dehumanizing. X um, happen in our state prison. Yes. And I've seen um, videos that are just horrific about the-, the And the unfortunately, outside. when you were showing, when you were, show, they were showing the pictures of a jail cell or, or an inmate cell, yes. it is far different from the pictures that are within our penitentiary system. That is so clean and so and so well taken care of and is used by the inmates. And I don't mean to sound this ugly, but the Mississippi State prison system and their sales are far more different. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, as I said at the outset, I'm talking from the California perspective, and I'm well aware that other states handle things quite differently. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a very frightening thing. I don't know if any of you saw the TV series For Life. Uh, the first season finished earlier this year and it's supposed to go into another season. It's based upon Isaac Wright Jr.'s uh, a life. He was framed for a drug as being a drug king. I saw it. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and if you watch that, the conditions in the prison are pretty horrendous. Uh, I mean, again, it shows how some of the uh, guards are involved with nefarious deeds, but you have different inmates that have power over others. And uh, I mean, they're knifings and uh, just all kinds of brutality and, and rapes. And, uh, and, I'm, and that happens. I mean, one of, uh, at least one of the people with whom I correspond and, and knew personally before he went in, uh, he was raped in prison. So, uh, I mean, that kind of thing does happen. And uh, what you're saying in terms of the, the image of the, uh, the cell, um, they, I mean, a lot of, I often send pictures that uh, people can post uh, or put up on their walls to help decorate or uh, wonderful, wonderful drawings that they make. It's like, it, it seems like every, uh, inmate has uh, secret talent, either visual or artistic work, or uh, as in the book itself, uh, there are poems and vignettes that they've written. So there's a lot of creative talent there. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but even here in California, uh, for often next to no reason, uh, the guards will uh, come into a cell and ransack it, just and, and tear down their artwork and trash the place and things that uh, uh, are valuable to them. Uh, not necessarily things like animate objects, but you know, letters and, and artwork and uh, 
things that their family or friends have sent them and uh, and even textbooks that they may have. And, and uh, some of uh, my guys have told me that, you know, they've had to start all over again. They're halfway through a class and they've had to start all over again. So, uh, which is a problem in itself because uh, they have to have money to uh, pay for uh, tuition for some of these classes and they have to pay for their their books and their scantrons and all that. And uh, a lot of them do have jobs, but you know, a lot of these jobs start out at eight cents an hour. So uh, you can imagine how long it takes to uh, save up uh, even a little bit of money. And a lot of that goes for buying, you know, toothpaste and uh, shaving equipment and, and that kind of shampoo, that kind of uh, thing. Um, so, and some of them try to earn more money legally or otherwise, and when I say otherwise, it could be through gambling, uh, to send money to their uh, family. So uh, it's, it's pretty wretched, uh, the, the uh, drawing that you alluded to, uh, I know makes it look like, oh, uh, it's lovely. But if you look at the dimensions, you're talking about two people in extremely crowded cell and one toilet uh, that doesn't always work. And uh, I mean, they just, it, it doesn't necessarily reveal the harshness of it unless you read the stories that go along with it. And so that's one of the biggest conflicts to me is um, how the prison industrial system makes profit off of the person that makes 25 cents an hour. I know, yes. you know my yes. cousin Ronald, he works, um, uh, he has a jobs, he had a lot of jobs over the years. Oh, yes. And no wages. So it's, it's a serious conflict. The other thing, I wrote one of our senators to see if they would sign a bill to reduce the cost of a family making a collect phone call, which I understand is oh, yes. $25 for 15 minutes. And the other problem is that um, the our, our Congress makes so few laws that really help uh, uh, change the prison industrial uh, complex that we, we really don't get anywhere. And so- now, that's Interesting about uh, what you're saying about the cost of a phone call. Uh, I've uh, created an account uh, so that I could talk to uh, uh, a couple of the prisoners and uh, $10, if I put $10 in the account, uh, it lasts forever. I mean, I don't know if it's like 10 cents a minute or less than that. So you're talking about $5. I mean, uh, what did you say it was $5? Uh, $25 for 15 minutes. Yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. And so, then the commissary yeah. is expensive. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh -huh. then like, if you want to, uh, one of my guys uh, was telling me how uh, because a lot of times the, the prisons don't have air conditioning, don't have heating, it's always broken down. Oh, yeah. And so one of my uh, guys was saying how, how we could use some socks, you know. He wasn't asking me, but he was just saying his feet are so cold. So uh, there are different companies that uh, will you can order through them and they'll send the uh, garments or other things to the inmate. So I sent him um, a number of socks and he wrote me back and I said, well, did you ever get them? And he said, I'm only allowed to get, uh, you know, a package. I think it was like once every three months. So if somebody else had sent him something already during that three months and I sent him something unbeknownst to me, they don't give it to him. And so he said, they'll probably just keep it themselves, you know. So a lot of things are very arbitrary. Like another person I've been writing to him consistently, we've been writing back and forth. And all of a sudden I get a letter back saying it was refused by uh, the prison and the post office. And so I called the prison and I was sent to you know, the general office and also the mail room and I had the correct information uh, and they said they don't know why that happened, but it can be very arbitrary. Maybe somebody doesn't like somebody or they were in a bad mood that day, but that has never happened to me before where the whole thing, it was just refused and sent back to me. And these people uh, really count on 
the correspondence. I mean, I, I write regularly. I try to uh, answer a letter within a day or two or three days. So they know I'm going to get back to them. And then when they haven't heard from me for a while, and it turns out that the letter was returned to me. And I know Sheriff Ar Arpaio, you might remember, hit from Maricopa County in, in, uh, in uh, Arizona. Um, There's a woman that I was corresponding with. And uh, I sent her a letter. It was sent back to me saying that they're not allowed to receive letters. So I called. They said, you have to send a postcard by a, a certain size postcard. So then I wrote out a letter on a postcard. They sent it back to me that, no, you, you have to have a metered stamp on it. You can't have a, you know, the kind of stamps that you get at the post office. Uh, the rationale is, oh, there might be drugs underneath the stamp, you know, or a secret message. So a lot of places make it very difficult for simple things like correspondence or getting packages. And you also mentioned, um, you know, we know that being in prison is involuntary servitude. Yes. But the fact that an uh, officer could come in and destroy your art, your pictures, your letters, it's a... Uh, killing the person's spirit like you did yes in and to me when the institution allows that to be the norm we have a serious societal problem and um i don't know what could be done for them because i've seen a facebook post where people say that uh mean things like they're in prison what's wrong to mean slop but you know they used to when we were slaves they would our food would be dirty you know, right. they, uh, it's so it's it's uh, it's so inhumane, and I don't know how you could change a society. Who but see, that's what I was saying about the different, that you know, the different funding. Now that all of the private corporations are now coming into the state to buying this facility and buying that facility, Meredith, what you were talking about did used to happen. Did used to be uh, classes and skill training and work areas and unfortunately here in mississippi all of that is gone now and it's coming from the private people that's coming in to take over the contracts don't offer anything well and all one of thing that typically is gone unfortunately they typically is gone because the state does not control it as it was and as it should be now because the privates all they want is make the money well, it's really up to state government to do something about it. And unfortunately, that's not what's going on in, in Mississippi and other places. No, that's not. Not to be too political, not. but yes. Joe Very Biden political. has promised that there <laughs> he would do away with the privatization of the prison system. And I believe that because he and, and Obama uh, were making first steps uh, even uh, during uh, that administration. So I, I do believe his commitment to doing away with this. It's just, if people knew, but you know what, what some of you have said about, well, you know, they've committed a crime, so why do they need to be treated well? Well, it's counterproductive. You know, they're not going, they're going to spend their time, they're going to spend their time in prison and most of them will get out at some point. If we don't take the time and the investment in changing them, transforming them into productive citizens. There's more recidivism, more crime. It's uh, passed on from generation to generation. Uh, we have to break those cycles. So people are being very short-sighted when they uh, speak like that. They just don't understand that how they themselves and their family and friends can be adversely affected if we don't do something to positively transform people that have committed crimes. And most, as I said earlier, most of these crimes are committed by very young people, either in their teens, some of them even younger than that, like 10, 11, 12 years old, or in their early 20s. I, I believe all the people with whom I work were young people when they first went to prison. None of them were older. Oh, I want to yes. say I really appreciate you, Ms. Jenkins. Well, thank you, George. All the yes, and all that you do. Can you I speak know. a little louder, maybe? Oh, yeah. I may have my mic in cover. <laughs> I'm, I'm just talking on two different phones here. I, I really appreciate you, George. You said two days.
very interesting thing in the beginning of your presentation was keep uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, you're you're muted. It, it unmute shows, yourself. It shows that you're muted. There you go. <laughs> it, it did it all. <laughs> there you go. Now there it, you go. I hate to ask you to repeat, but no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, see that's really bad. bad. If I turn off my phone, I don't know which one. I'm going to turn off my phone. Okay. Because you're down here twice, I think, on the computer yes. and the phone. Yes. Because I right. Okay. Yes, I'm going to the computer. Right. And um, after her question, we'll have to wrap up because we have to do the evaluations. Right. Well, after one or two more questions, you, uh, you have each been sent an evaluation form. So uh, we want to give you some time. Now, uh, Meredith, do they email that to you how, how does that work how do they get the evaluation yes um uh, uh, first i i, I want to um uh, acknowledge that um uh, community library of mississippi goes virtual was funded in part by the mississippi humanities council and actually this was our uh, first federal grant first grant period we started this nonprofit uh in july of 2019 and uh, our evaluation forms can be filled out from your email. Everyone has already received the email and you can just type in the email and forward it back to community library, Mississippi.ms uh, at gmail.com where you get it from. But we really hope that you will give us uh, your feedback. It only takes a, a couple of minutes to fill out the evaluation. Ms. Yeah. Georgia, are you ready to ask your question? Uh, I'm ready, yes. I don't know what's wrong. I really don't. I really well, don't. you're speaking uh, through iPhone right now. No, ma'am. Oh, turn it off. Okay, now Rose I can hear you, I can hear you now. Oh, well, hold on, I'm thinking that I'm, I'm Ms. Uh, George is trying to ask some question. Okay, I'm a student of Dr. Joy DeGruy Leary, the author of Post PTSD. I know you're familiar with her, right? She is. Uh huh. Okay. And what you're saying is, is interesting. You're dealing with PTSD, which is post traumatic slave syndrome. That is her approach to dealing with the prison system. She lives in Rutgers Island, or is it right, Rutgers Rikers. Island? Rikers By the way, Island. I worked with a, a group of people uh, that whose goal was to shut down Rikers, and it is going to be shut down in the yes. next couple of years. Thank God. Yes. That she and her husband are instrumental in that. And once there were, there was a group of uh, powerhouses, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, educator, who said that our most brilliant minds and most creative minds are locked up. Yes. And, but we know what's happening. And, and it's good that we are trying to do something about it. But for our president to say that the virus is affecting virtually nobody. I love it when he speaks. I hear him when he speaks. I hear what he says when he speaks. And it is because it is not the billionaires that are being affected by the virus. It's the prisoners, it's the elderly who are dispensable. Once you pass 21, you become start becoming dispensable. So we it's our responsibility as a people to understand what is being said. And we wouldn't advocate for our young people to be locked up. Did, did the Supreme Court not decide or did they rule that if you are 25 years of, old, years of age, especially if you're a black male, your brain is not fully developed. So you can't get a life sentence. That, that's right. And, and it's, it's true about, we have learned that uh, uh, the human brain does not develop fully uh, until later so a lot of people don't understand when they're uh, engaged in a certain act what the consequences are they they don't understand they're living in the here and now and and they don't understand the the consequences so uh that's i i agree i mean i i just i don't believe i never believed in capital punishment anyway and i don't mm -hmm. even believe in uh life without parole anymore except for people that are so mentally ill that they would never be able to reintegrate into society. But those numbers are very few. And I, I can imagine, yes. I cannot, imagine, I don't, I can't see how anyone can get satisfaction 
out of watching other human beings being tortured, losing their mental stability. It's just, unless you go around sucking blood like a vampire. Normal process of a child to grow and develop. I grew up in a predominantly white environment and I watched children actually develop and normally make mistakes, do things. Right. But then we couldn't develop normally, especially if we were a male. Right. You could tell that there was there were traps set for you along the way. Absolutely. So, there's another step. I, I just it, this is the most sensitive subject in the world to me. Well, it's heartbreaking. I, I've been in tears many times just reading the letters of uh, my my friends, and I'm <clears throat> I'm so thrilled when some of them have been able to achieve uh, various degrees of success, whether it's certifications or degrees, and and uh, have been able to enter the the job world either with uh, blue collar physical labor or white collar you know professions. Uh, but there's so many that are just uh, sinking because of mental illness. I don't know if years ago, uh, I think it was Denzel Washington was in the movie about Hurricane Carter. Do you remember that movie a long time ago? Yeah. There's a, a scene in there when he was put in a solitary, which is another issue. Just it, it, that should be banned. Uh, you know, solitary was never meant for people to stay in for a months or even years. Some people have been in solitary for like, you know, 10 years or more. Uh, but there's a scene where through the visual, you're able to see his mind uh, disintegrate, at least uh, during that period when he was in confinement like that. And they did such a good job getting you the, trying to help you understand what it's like uh, when your mind is uh, being so disturbed by your conditions. We have, we don't have a right as another human being. We have no rights, like you said, human beings, we have no rights to hurt each other. And I'm, I'm still grappling with the crucifixion of Christ. So you know where I'm coming <laughs> from. There's, yes, I hear you. There's no justification for it. And that was a pretty, you know, that was a common way of executing people in those days what uh, was uh, crucifying them it's all political yes it wasn't that you indeed. didn't feel oh something. indeed indeed yeah. yes all political and the prisons i hope but you know even if you go to the old testament uh you know we talk about sanctuary cities today there were cities of refuge where people could go uh, and you know they couldn't leave but they could lead a, a relatively normal life other than being confined to that city. And I know uh, even during uh, the time of uh, Russia before the Soviet Union, uh, criminals were often sent to Siberia for uh, punishment, but they weren't put in prisons. They had to make their way to Siberia, establish themselves in a community, get a job which paid for their room and board, a family members could even come out. But Siberia is such a, a, an extreme, uh, you know, location, not only miles, you know, thousands of miles from where they had lived, but uh, the extremes in temperature. Uh, so a lot of societies over the centuries have had a much more uh, reasonable ways of um, punishment. And they were and called and even an eye for an eye is misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, people need to understand and look at things through a different prism. Wasn't it criminally, the criminally insane that were taken from Europe, put on the islands, especially in, uh, where are the kangaroos? Pardon? Where are the kangaroos? I can't think of it. I'm, I've drawn a blank here. Oh, the Cameroons? No, no, kangaroos. Uh, Australia. Oh, Australia. Australia. Yes. Where were they were put on ships and, and... Well, they they were criminals, not necessarily criminally insane. They were criminals uh, that were sent away. And then uh, the French, uh, I can't remember the island where they sent prisoners. Uh, remember the story about Papillon? Uh, when he was sent there and escaped a couple times and um, 
so the different different countries over the centuries do it differently but getting back you know crucifixion was certainly one of the cruelest uh ways and then and then you know i mean you think about during the times of the roman empire when uh, they would have iron chairs that would be heated and uh, force a person to sit there until they you know were incinerated or the iron maiden that's like a coffin with spikes and they would close the door on the person i mean we seem to be able to uh, come up with the most horrifying wow. ways to punish people if they're criminally insane would do something like that to punish them. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we we're, we're um, coming to a, a close on on this event. We went over a little bit, but I'm uh, I'm glad that we were able to get to um, a stopping point. This event um, will be live on uh, our Facebook page, we Library of Mississippi, and I'm uh, going to also do a video. It will also be on uh, YouTube. And the name of the YouTube. Uh, video would be juvenile offenders. Uh, Can you send us uh, links? Uh, send out email uh, through email the links so that yes, for, I, could, I could forward it to other people to help. Sure, them, you know? sure I could. I could do that. Well, and now, thank you for inviting me to be a speaker. I, I really. Oh, appreciate thank it. you so much for um, this subject matter, and, I, and you, you are a perfect speaker because you, you you've done all of this. <laughs> research all these uh, juvenile offender writers and you know you I've, I've read the stories you know so intimately I know some of the stories intimately Rosa said in the chat absolutely fantastic presentation thank you so very much um, yes indeed send the links I would like to attend more of your events um, like our Facebook page if you're not on Facebook, I'm going to send you the uh, link to the website. Let me send her this. Uh... Okay, I'm sending you the Facebook page link where the live presentation will be. And also, I'm going to send you um, our website. Give me one second. And the uh, the presentation will also be on our website. All right, but uh, I'm just saying, for those I'm of saying. us who are not as sharp about these things, if you that link that you just put on, if you could also include it in an email. Yeah, I'm gonna send you. I'm just sending okay. it to her. Got I'll it. send it to her in the uh, in the chat. Okay. All uh, right. Oh, she she gave me her email. I got your email now. Okay, so. Um, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and it's it's uh it's been a great event and it's a wrap. You all have a wonderful. All right. Have a have a great week. Thank you again for having me. Take Thank care. You. Be well, everybody. Be well. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> bye bye. Have a good one, Miss Jenkins. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Take care. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye bye. Bye.